Hi everyone, and welcome to Pathfinder presented by Payload, the leading digital media company in the space industry. My guest today is Ellen Stofan, the Undersecretary for Science and Research at the Smithsonian. Ellen has had a prolific career in the space industry as a planetary geologist, having worked on a variety of projects and missions surrounding Venus, Mars, and Saturn's moon Titan. She was notably the chief scientist at NASA from 2013 to 2016, and was the principal advisor to then NASA Administrator Charlie Bolden on the agency's science programs and science-related strategic planning and investments. Joining me today to interview Ellen is none other than Payload's very own Rachel Sisk. We have a lot to go through today, so let's dive right in. Ellen, thank you so much for being on the show. Um, and we have so much to cover and not a lot of time. Um, I also brought on my uh, resident uh, scientist, Rachel Zisk, on the show today to help with questions. So I'm going to jump right into it. So my first question really is, um, I want to paint a bit of a picture for you. So uh, you're just coming off of a few successful missions, exploratory missions, um, one to Venus, one to Titan, um, and some of the first science missions relate on, on the shuttle. And all of a sudden you get a call to uh, join NASA as the chief scientist. So not just a scientist, but the scientist. Can you, can you talk, can you share a little bit more about, you know, your time as uh, chief scientist at NASA? What led you to that role and what does it really entail or did it really entail? You know, I'd say through my career, I made a bunch of random decisions, usually based on projects that were interesting to me, that were challenging. And one thing kind of led to another and ultimately to being chief scientist. I'm a planetary geologist. I study volcanoes around the solar system, um, how they form, how you can learn by comparing planets to each other. And because of that, I early on, I got involved in NASA missions, starting with the Magellan mission to Venus. Then I was involved with Cassini. But because I worked on Saturn's moons, which are very, very cold and far out in the solar system, Venus, which is very, very hot, but both of those places have a lot to teach us about planetary evolution. I got really interested in technology because here you are pushing the spectrums of technology to operate in these very extreme environments. I also worked a lot on planetary radars because you have to have a radar to see through the clouds on Venus or through the haze on Titan. And so then Charles Alachi was involved. I was at JPL. He was involved with um, a shuttle mission to fly a radar to look at the Earth. Uh, back in 1994. And he said, Oh, Ellen, you understand planet, you know, radars, why don't you come work on that? So I, all of a sudden, I'm working on this human space flight program, I'm down at Johnson Space Center with a headset on saying Roger and Wilco and, and um, doing shuttle operations. So, you know, fast forward years later, I've worked on a proposal to send a boat to a sea on Saturn's moon Titan, which ultimately fails. Instead, the InSight mission gets get selected. And I'm trying to figure out what to do with the rest of my life. And I get this call saying, do you want to interview to be chief scientist of NASA? And I think, well, I'm not qualified, you know, total imposter syndrome, right? I'm not qualified to do that. And when I went in for the interview, I'm like, yeah, I've done NASA technology. I've done human space flight. I've done earth science at NASA, planetary science at NASA. And again, massive. And all of a sudden you're like, oh, I actually built this this resume, I actually am qualified to do this job shock. Um, you know, and so it ended up being just an incredibly fun and challenging three and a half years uh, working at NASA headquarters in a really interesting um, time during the second Obama administration. Absolutely. You come into this role with such uh, with a resume that really runs the gamut of, of topics at, at NASA and roles at NASA. How do you take that experience that you had there at, um, throughout some of the different um, positions of the agency and turn that into kind of a guiding philosophy or mission for your time as chief scientist? You know, for me, it was always, and, and I have to backtrack for a second. Um, you know, you might know that my father worked for NASA. Um, I went to my first rocket launch when I was four years old. I grew up around the agency. I grew up during the era of Apollo. I grew up in, you know, fifth grade defending to my fellow classmates why we should be sending humans to the moon, why space exploration. So this is kind of in my DNA. And to me, you know, people say we explore for lots of different reasons, right? Commercial profit. We explore for geopolitical reasons, right? 
But we also explore for knowledge, to explore the unknown, to inspire the next generation, you know, to push the limits of science and technology, to show what humans are capable of. And that was my, you know, guiding philosophy at NASA. It's how do we take this amazing luck that we've been given of this investment by the American people and and do, you know, as JPL said, go dare mighty things. Go go show what humans are capable of and exploring the universe, exploring the solar system, moving humans out beyond low Earth orbit. And so to me, it was always about the mission. Like, how do we always be sure that we're really pushing NASA's mission forward? Uh, and so it was an incredibly exciting time because um, Charlie Bolden, who that, at that time was the administrator, you know, he, he gave me a lot of leeway to kind of go and push on things. So it was really fun. So your, your father was at NASA. Your mother was a science teacher. Was this always in the cards or were you pushing back in the very beginning? You know, my sister's an attorney, so this didn't affect her. So, um, <laughs> you know, I think, I think for me, it was just always in, a car, in the cards. I didn't really, though, think I would grow up to work at NASA because everyone who worked at NASA looked like my dad, um, you know, white guy with a crew cut, you know. And so I thought, well, I want to be a scientist. NASA's full of engineers. Um, I'm not a guy. I'm not an engineer. So I'll probably go into academia. And it was really once I was in graduate school, I knew I wanted to go work on planets. I knew I wanted to work with NASA data. But when I, even in graduate school, I started working on the Magellan mission. Um, I really love working in teams, diverse, talented teams, where everybody brings in a different point of view, a different skill set. And all of a sudden, you're doing crazy cool things. And that, to me, was what exploration is all about. You're bringing together really talented teams and pushing the, the edge of what you can do. And so I realized, okay, I don't really want to go be a professor. You know, I want to go work on spacecraft missions. I want to go work at NASA. So I didn't initially see myself as a NASA person, but it was always about science. And once I went to the Viking launches and heard Carl Sagan talking about looking for life beyond Earth, I was pretty much stuck at that point. Weird 14-year-old, I know, but that's where I was. <laughs> You've got kind of a storied history at this point in space exploration through your tenure at NASA and um, going back, obviously, to your childhood. What changes do you think you've seen in the agency and in the way that we approach space exploration um, during the time that you've been involved with these projects? Well, certainly whose voices are in the room, who's in the room has really changed for the positive. We, we still have a long way to go. But, but, you know, again, the agency of my father, which was an agency of manned spaceflight, and, um, and now we're in an era of human spaceflight. You know, who gets to, who gets to participate, who's in the room um, has really changed. And to me, that just means we're going from strength to strength as we really tap into more people's per perspectives and more people's talent. The other thing that I've seen, you know, which to me has been really exciting is whether it's in, you know, communications where, you know, satellite communications was initially like the government, right? But then as it became something more routine, it got, and there was, and there was a profit motive, it got turned over to the private sector. Now we're seeing this new kind of evolution revolution of commercial the commercial space sector and it getting stronger and stronger and so there's going to be this you know it's playing out right now where is there enough profit motive that you truly do turn to a commercial model leaving nasa to do that cool exploration right a private company is never going to do the james webb space telescope that's for governments to do and so this evolving role between where you draw the line between government investment, private investment, I think is really fun and watching the evolution of it. And probably the final thing that is for me, again, back to the crazy science that keeps me motivated. You know, we're at a point in human history where we understand that life could have evolved beyond Earth. 
we know where to go look in our solar system, you know, Mars, Europa, Enceladus, Titan. We have the technology we need. And, and so it's within our grasp to really understand was there a second origin of life within our own solar system? And what does that mean as we search for Earth like planets around other stars? And so um, that to me is, is crazy exciting. And, and to think we're living right at this point in time where all of a sudden all of this work over the last 60 years has brought us to this point is really exciting. Can we uh, talk for a second about your post NASA career? So I'm sure you had a lot of different options about where to go and what to do. But after NASA, you know, you went down this road where now it's led you to a very, very senior role at the Smithsonian. So can you talk a little bit about what drove those kind of decision points post NASA and maybe why you decided not to you know, join the commercial space industry directly and why you felt like you could be more impactful at the Smithsonian? Well, you've probably picked up from talking to me that I'm kind of passionate about all this. And, and this idea of how do we get the public truly engaged in the why, in, in how to get them engaged in saying, you know, a lot of our future, space is critical to that. So whether it's satellites that are going to help us understand not only exactly what's happening with climate change, but how do you then use that data to turn around and help us find resilient solutions to climate change? You know, we need people understanding that. We need them engaged in it. And we need all hands on deck, right? Because if it's only people who looked like my dad out there involved, we're never going to be tapping into the talent of all of our population. So at the end of the administration, I was not a political appointee, but everybody I appointed to, uh, everybody I, you know, I worked for was, it, it was really interesting to me to say, how can I take this idea of getting the public engaged in space, in the business of space exploration, in the excitement of space exploration? And someone called me and said, well, the job of the director of Air and Space Museum just came open. And I thought, well, <laughs> that kind of lines up, you know, with, with my my big passion of getting the public, you know, what, an, this is the most visited museum in the United States. It's one of the top five muse visited museums in the world. And it's an incredible platform. It's incredibly important whose stories we're telling, what stories we're telling. And we were in the middle of about to be, to renovate the museum, redoing all that storytelling. So it was incredibly exciting for me to go to the museum at that time and really be involved in how we how we renovate it, how we think of again those stories that we were telling, really engaging the public in space exploration. But I did miss um, some of the aspects around which I did at NASA. This idea of how do you move science forward in kind of a strategic way, which I did as chief scientist of NASA, and at the Smithsonian, um, we have. Uh, two different science museums, the National Zoo and Conservation Biology Institute. We have an institute operating the Chandra X-ray uh, satellite for NASA. They just We just launched the Tempo instrument that's studying air pollution. We have a tropical research center in Panama and an environmental research center out in the Chesapeake Bay. So saying we've got all this science, we're really poised to help do science for impact that really helps us become more uh, resilient to climate change was really exciting to me. And so that's what I'm working on right now. That's really exciting. During your role, um, during your tenure, I mean, at the Smithsonian, um, did you ever find yourself running into conflicts between what the public, general public wanted to see and what you were really excited about sharing with them? Do you think, like, is there a pressure to kind of play the favorites? Or um, do you find that people are really excited and willing to engage with some of the new developments of things that are happening in space flight and space exploration. You know, when we would go out and do surveys of the visitors to the museum, um, they were really excited and confused about commercial space flight. Uh, um, you know, I, I can't tell you probably the most common question because uh, for a while I did a ton of public speaking. And whether I was speaking to fifth graders or college students or general public, they're all like, what's up with the commercial space industry? Are they competing with NASA? And you're like, no, they're not. It's a partnership. It's amazing. It's moving us forward faster 
and better and and wanting to get that story out. But the public is incredibly interested in it. Um, and, and so to me, it was a real opportunity to say, here's a museum that's not been renovated in years. And here's an opportunity to tell those stories about how, how we get to space is changing, what we're doing in space is changing, and who gets to go uh, is changing. And, and the public is actually extremely curious about it. So it was a really, it's a really fun opportunity. So in the renovated Air and Space Museum that um, will fully open in 2025, you're going to see a gallery on the future of spaceflight where we'll talk about issues like space debris and this issue of who gets to go to space. You'll see a whole new gallery talking about low Earth orbit and what's happened with the space station and where that might go. Uh, you'll see a gallery that really talks about technology and where technology is pushing both aviation and spaceflight. So a little more, I think, aligned with what the public is super curious about. So just touching on a few of those um, topics, I'm curious, how do you think at a, at a broad level, the commercial, the, the recent um, that significant shift and push towards the commercialization of space fit into the broader goals, NASA's broader goals of science and exploration. And, and, and I want to bring up sort of a, a, a funny kind of topic or, or kind of analogy. You, you see this in countless Hollywood movies, right? Where there's a scientist that has a very strong belief around a particular way that a mission should be run, but then, you know, the bureaucrats or like private interests get in the way and that typically ends in disaster in most movies. <laughs> They should listen right? to the scientists. <laughs> they, should just, they should just listen to the scientists. Exactly. Now, uh, I'm not going to ask. I'm certainly not going to ask, like, you know, um, if you expect that to happen. But I, I, I am more curious, like, you know, there is a bit of tug of war, right, that I, I, I suspect that we'll see between um, new space, um, the new space industry as they start working closer with government organizations where there may be a science aspect to a mission. And now there's so much, you know, private capital, venture capital, you know, private equity, um, companies are now going public, they're answering to shareholders at the same time, there's just been undercurrent of space, which has always been science and exploration. I'm kind of curious how you think about that as a sort of a ma- as a long term marriage. And you know, if you foresee any issues that might arise over um, as sort of the commercial space industry becomes larger and larger. I think there's always going to be some tension there because if you if you look at example a lot around a lot of the conversations on on moon to Mars, which which we're now um, at a point where everybody is pretty much signed on to this is the right thing to do. If we want to get humans on the surface of Mars, and again, I want them there with rock hammers breaking open rocks and finding evidence of past life, but I'm going to need humans for that. But we understand the moon is a critical stepping stone where we can test technologies, you know, form these partnerships that we need because going to Mars is hard. Um, there's, there's elements that are like, well, we're going to go to the moon and we're going to build all this infrastructure and, and we're going to stay. And you're like, okay, but that's not really, is that, well, it's a question. <laughs> I just gave my opinion there. Um, you know, what is the government's role in all this? Is the government just there to facilitate private industry? Or does the government have a separate science and exploration role? And and every time something has a profit motive and the commercial sector is ready to take it on, they can take it on and NASA will keep moving forward. It's been that way for 60 years. I hope I hope we keep doing that for another 60 years where NASA doesn't get um too drawn away from, to me, its primary mission of exploration, because that is what the agency is there. Is it there to help support as we move things to the private sector? Yes, but it's a balance, right? And it'll be interesting, especially as we get closer to humans on the moon, um, to see how that balance plays out. It's, you know, we don't know how it's going to and even in low Earth orbit, you know, we can talk about low Earth orbit. You see the same thing happening right now, right? Right now, it's a place for governments. You've got the private sector moving in. But the private sector is not going to stay unless there's a profit motive. And to me, that has to go beyond just the government. So can the government go from being an anchor tenant on a commercial space station to being a minor tenant 
and I'm it's not clear how that one's going to end. You you just you just walked into my next question, which was uh, was around the ISS, right? So you look at the ISS as a great example, and you brought this up earlier. You know, the International Space Station was uh, an initiative taken by governments around the world, and arguably the the, the largest collaborative science experiment that we've ever take, undertaken internationally. Right. And it's been incredibly impactful to our understanding of a lot of different things, but especially how humans interact and live in space over prolonged periods of time. And that's going to have significant impact and, and, and understanding of, of how we're going to operate in, in deep space and over over sort of these longer term kind of crude missions. Now, the next phase of orbital infrastructure is really going to be driven by private um, uh, private organizations, right? Organizations like Axiom and Sierra Space and Voyager, and there's there's many others who have said that they want to build orbiting kind of space station. Um, why do you think this shift is an important one to see? Um, should governments maintain the ability to continue doing this type of um, kind of capital investment? And, and it's, it, you've already kind of mentioned your opinion on that point. But I'm more curious, like, what do you think sort of the downside effects of this? And like, one thing that I, I actually think about is let's just say you have company X that has con- overtaken the the, the, the the space station, or, or they now are running the space station. But and to your point, let's just say the government originally becomes is, you know, first anchor customer, then over time becomes minor customer. Um, and then what ends up happening is, let's just say this company X figures out there's all this other revenue opportunity doing all this stuff, but that ultimately doesn't drive the science and exploration mission of the government, and they're sort of put to the side. Like, I mean, that that do you see that as a real risk? And how how does the government prevent that from happening over the? And I'm talking over decades, right? This isn't something that necessarily we're going to be worrying about at the end of this decade. I I see it as an opportunity, um, not a risk, because when you consider right now. Um, NASA's budget, you know, we've gotten some really good budgets um, from Congress, but but the issue becomes you have a chunk of money that's going towards low Earth orbit, um, maintaining the space station, commercial crew, commercial cargo. If NASA wants to go and really use this, the moon as a stepping stone to Mars, they need a chunk of that money because you're not getting a big chunk on top of what. So you have to say, we've got to ramp down spending in, in low Earth orbit so that we can ramp up spending beyond low Earth orbit. Otherwise, there's just not, there's not money to do that further exploration. And, and so to me, the exciting part is as we see that ramp down and NASA can be taking those dollars and investing them towards more exploration and away from what I would argue becomes kind of routine operations. So why can't we turn it over to a company? And if there is a strong profit motive to have commercial space stations beyond just, you know, the the government's as anchor tenants, then that's really exciting. And I think that's a whole new era. And what that looks like, you know, is it going to be materials manufacturing? Is it going to be tourism? Is it going to be some combination of all of the above? We still don't know quite what that's going to look like. You know, what is the demand? And what does that exactly look like? So that NASA can put its resources towards moving beyond low Earth orbit, where we've been. And, And I will point out, part of the original case for creating the space station, and my dad was actually involved in that, was using learning to live in space so that we can send humans to Mars. And that's what we have gloriously, wonderfully used the ISS for. We now understand how to live in space. We know how to build a toilet that pretty much works in space, which is really important for sending humans to Mars. You know, we know how to maintain the life support environment. We know how to recycle water. All these technologies that we didn't know how to do at the beginning of the space station era, it has largely served its purpose for getting us ready to have humans in longer term duration beyond low Earth orbit, which is really exciting. And I I feel like a lot of the times we don't give the ISS enough credit for, for the fact it has allowed us now to contemplate these bigger, bolder missions. 
Yeah, it's exciting to hear you talk about this with so much um, enthusiasm um, to, to look back and see that the ISS has really done um, so much of the job that we've asked it to do. Um, and now you think, or do you think that it's the right long-term model looking forward that commercial space focus on near-Earth activity and building space stations in low Earth orbit um, so that NASA can look further into, into deep space? Absolutely, because again, if you look at like launch services, you know, why are we now relying on, on commercial companies for launch services? Originally, NASA did it. And, and it was because when you've developed a technology to the point where it becomes pretty reliable and you've developed it to a point where not only you have one company, you have multiple companies who can compete, you know, for those not just government contracts but now commercial communication satellite contracts. And so all of a sudden there's a business model there. And in my mind, that's what we're all wishing for low earth orbit. We would love for low, low earth orbit to get to the point. I think communications has demonstrated the communications industry is, is totally a profit motive. Earth observation, you know, you see these, you know, whether it's Maxar or Planet or all these other companies that have come forward um, with our private Earth observation um, companies, that when you look at how those data are being used in things like the war in Ukraine or or understanding, you know, implications of what's going on with the climate, that commercial Earth observation sector is just is just really amazing. So then the question is, what are the next things in low Earth orbit that are going to return that kind of profit motive, that that ability to really change how we live here on Earth. And I'm I'm excited. I think there's a lot of possibilities. There's a lot of research we've done on the ISS that that people are just still trying to figure out where is this going to go. Let's talk about Mars. So uh, well, why don't we start here? So since your tenure, um, how has NASA's strategy um, around a crewed mission to Mars evolved? You know, I think there's a lot of similarities. You know, when you're trying to do something that's really hard, having continuity of purpose um, is really important. And so what I have seen over, frankly, the last several administrations is keeping that North Star as, as being, we know we want to send humans to Mars. You know, you don't really, you don't hear people questioning that. How we're going to get there, what kind of architecture is going to get there how we do it within budgets is always going to be, you know, the debate. And that's healthy because technology evolves, your priorities evolve, geopolitics evolves. And so how you, you keep focused on that North Star is always going to be a bit of a circuitous path. But to me, what I've really appreciated over, over now multiple administrations is the ultimate goal is, is to get humans to Mars. My frustration comes, and this is something that I certainly reflected on a lot as director of the Air and Space Museum um, during the 50th anniversary of the first landing on the moon. Um, you know, when John F. Kennedy said, we're going to land, a, a per I think he did say man, a man on the moon within the decade, at that point, we didn't really have spacesuits. We really didn't understand life support systems. We didn't know how to navigate to the moon. We didn't know how to land on the moon. What we didn't know when he made that challenge to the American people is pretty stunning. And it took 400,000 Americans to, you know, nine and a half years later to achieve that vision. And so when people say to me, and, <laughs> you know, how long is it going to take people to get to Mars? Or how far away are we from getting to Mars? We're as far away as our conviction to set a date and do it. There's lots of challenges to getting to Mars that we have not resolved yet. But I would argue they pale in comparison to the challenges that we had when John F. Kennedy said, let's go to the moon within a decade. There are huge challenges, not putting that aside. And how we get there is going to be complicated, but we've got to take the first step. And the first step is returning to the moon. And that's what NASA is focused on. How do you gauge the, the level of commitment that the, the space industry maybe or the American public has to 
this initiative that um, that NASA is pushing at the commercial space industry is so excited about to put people back on Mars or to put people on Mars, not back. I think there's a lot of excitement about it, actually, because um, Charlie, Charlie Bolden and I used to laugh. He said, you know, he'll go out and talk about like five different things on various speeches during a month. And we he would talk about um, sending humans back to Mars. All of a sudden, it would end up on like the front page of, of you know, national news coverage. I think people are excited about this. I think people want to be inspired by something. Um, I think right now, if you look, there was just a, a study that came out, I think, last week that says, you know, a lot of humans right now really feel like NASA should be putting a lot of emphasis on climate change, which, which it is absolutely doing. Um, it is using our Earth observation satellites to collect important data. And not only that, it is trying to make that data increasingly information that can be acted upon to help us become more resilient to climate change. So I, I think the agency is following a path um, that there is huge support for from the American public. And I think people are excited about it. I also think people are really excited by this idea of, of it being a public, private, international thing, you know, that it's not just NASA. It's like multiple space agencies and it's the private sector. And that the people who land on Mars are going to look like all of us, not just like some of us. What are some of the uh, remaining scientific and technological challenges or technical challenges that we need to overcome today that you still see to send humans um, to Mars and, uh, and you know, bring them back to Earth? And, you know, there's the easy ones, which is like the length of time it takes and sort of the thin atmosphere of, 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 of Mars. And, you know, there's, a, there's sort of the things that we know already, but are there anything, is there anything that, you know, right now that we, we still do not have the answer to? You know, one of the most intriguing things, you know, is, is this duration question, right? Because the sooner we get there, there's a whole cascade because the longer you take to get there, that's increasing problems with a lot of systems below, like the working toilet, right? And so the longer you have to keep the toilet working, you have to have food that's stable, medicines that are stable. You're also submitting humans to radiation levels that you're then going to have to shield against. Um, so this, these ideas of where you see um, constantly NASA poking at is, you know, investing in advanced propulsion, um, I think is really critical. There's been an ongoing forever issue about do you rotate the spacecraft to induce some level of artificial gravity right now that's not um that's not been a path that anybody's um decided to pursue and then the issue of entry descent and landing i mean we've landed on mars many times successfully we have had failed landings on mars um it is hard to do uh and we still have work that can be done but i think to think about how do we use the Earth as a test bed for sending humans to Mars? How do we use the moon as a test bed? Um, we can get there. And, you know, this is what I know NASA has been doing over the last couple of years is pulling apart these various problems and saying, all right, how do we tackle each one step by step to get there? Absolutely. And we're taking steps also on the commercial side. I think um, we can't really talk about the path to Mars without talking about Starship. Um, so what do you think the impact of Starship will be on this Mars initiative and on science and exploration in general? Well, you know, I think everybody has realized that, you know, launch capability is really critical, right? You look, um, whether it's the SLS, whether it's Starship, we need heavy lift, significant heavy lift capability to get humans back to the moon, um, to get the materials we need out to the moon to get humans to Mars. And so Starship to me is really exciting because it's, it's on the critical path, you know, along with the space launch system of doing what we want. And if you only have one, you're vulnerable, right? I, I mean, anytime you're relying on a single system, your overall architecture is going to be, is going to be vulnerable. So the fact that right now we have multiple pathways of how we're going to get humans back to the surface of the moon on how we're going to get humans to Mars, I think is, is really critical. And when I was chief scientist at NASA, there was a guy, um, David Miller, uh, who's now at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and he was the chief technologist. And 
he really taught me a lot about this thinking about architectures as being flexible. And the more flexibility you bring into architectures, you know, the more chance you have of success, which is which is what we all want. So I have, a, I have a question I've been dying to ask you around Starship. And uh, Rachel alluded to it a little bit, which is like its effect on science and exploration. And, and I want to tie this back to a, an issue that you had that I heard in an earlier interview that you did from some, some years back. Um, you, you, know, you, you were talking about sending a floating probe to the Sea of Titan. And a friend had called you from Lockheed Martin and was telling you that you know, they, they wanted you on this project. And you were like, well, I don't know if this is possible. But then you're like, let's dig in and see what happens, right? And you're asking about all these things, like, can I have a motor? Can I have a sail? Can I have this? Can I have that? And, you know, usually the answer was no, right? You're always constrained by mass. And I am kind of curious, like, one of the things or one of the, um, one of the outstanding or the, the, a thesis that's out there around Starship is this idea that it's going to completely blow open this idea of mass and design constraints. And it's going to have significant impact for science and exploration just in terms of cost. Like, you look at the JWST. Um, during the original kind of NASA science directorate, like from 10 years ago or, or so, it, you know, they, they, the, the proposal said like JWST would cost like half a billion dollars or maybe a billion dollars at most. And it ended up costing, you know, multiples higher than that, because as you, you know, went through the process and the build, you realized you needed to make things smaller. And when you make things smaller, it becomes more expensive. Um, how, how do you think about that? Well, first of all, do you agree with that concept that, you know, once Starship is operational, it's going to change this kind of idea of engineering around design and mass constraints. And if that's the case, do you think that, do you think um, we're thinking about that enough? Like is, is our current NASA engineers or just like engineers in general, like within the space industry thinking about what impact that could have on cost and the type of things that we can actually do in terms of space exploration? You know, I can tell you the scientific community has been watching it really closely because um, there's the issue of mass um, but frankly, for many of us there's, who's, who really love the outer solar system, there's the issue of time. You know, when you can throw something a lot harder from Earth, you get there a lot faster. Um, and right now, for example, I'm on the Dragonfly mission, and we're talking kind of like seven-year transit times to, from Earth to Titan. You know, you have to do gravity assists and everything else. You know, in the career of a scientist, especially an aging scientist, um, that gets to be really intimidating. The outer solar system is super far away. And when you can say this will reduce travel times to the outer solar system to kind of three, four or five years, that's huge. In terms of you being able to answer scientific questions, being able to formulate new questions and then go answer those questions. Because right now, it's like you go out to Saturn and you're probably going to wait another 20, 30 years before you get another mission because of cost, which goes to mass, frankly. So I, I'm always a little bit on the more mass you give me, the more cost you're going to have. So I'm not so concerned about mass. I'm really into the trip time. It's all about the trip time um, for me because I study Titan. So that's, that's where that comes in. But there's no question. Um, Scientists are always going to really love heavy lift launch vehicles because they get us more stuff and they get us there a whole lot faster. Are there any other innovations that you've seen from commercial space that gets you excited about reducing that time or, or improving the um, efficacy of some of the, the science experiments that are planned? You know, a lot of the innovations that have been going on in communications have been amazing because the more sophisticated questions we're asking the more and more data volume. And it's not, you know, this is something the science community obviously really worries about is data volume. How do you get that data volume back to the earth? How do you get it down on the ground? Um, so there's ongoing technology development in those areas, which is a little, maybe a little more boring to people than a launch vehicle. Um, but, but to the scientific community, it's incredibly important. And then there's the whole, what data do you send down? What can a spacecraft do on its own? So the more things um, the more autonomous you can get spacecraft to be, that also brings down cost. So there's whole aspects of technology development that really go to better, smaller, more capable instruments, more capable spacecraft, more capable comms. Um, and all those help strengthen and strengthen missions um, as, you, as you try to put them together. So I know we're running out of time here a little bit. So with these last like 
seven or eight questions. I'm, we're gonna we're gonna shift into what I would call a little bit more like theoretical or like fun type questions. So I'm gonna kick us off. Um, so let's let's fast forward to a point where let's just say all these things that we're talking about are solved. New novel types of propulsion, life support systems that significantly ex extend our ability to go into deep space planetary bodies. What would be um, for you the most in interesting place to have humans visit outside of Mars? Because I think everyone's talking about Mars, but I'm curious outside of Mars, what's a, a, a plant, uh, whether it's a planet or, or not a planet, but that you would love to see humans travel to in our lifetime? You know, for me, it's really about right, right tool, right location, or or multiple tools in the right location. So to me, I'm always thinking, well, what would be way easier to do? Because, you know, people talk about human missions to Venus, and you're like, mm, huge amount of investment, and, and what's the return? Um, I, 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 full disclosure, and I'm not endorsing anything, in The Expanse, I was like my favorite show of the last decade. Because it made you, to me, it made you think in one of the more realistic ways, I think, what would it mean to really hate humans to have access to our, our solar system, to be able to be on the surface of Jupiter's moons, to be out on the surface of Titan, to have humans be in a place where they can see Saturn rise above the horizon and have it be looming above you. So from an artistic, emotional point of view, Absolutely tight, and it's going to win every time. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> but to me, this issue of really having humans be where humans should be and, and bring the most value, it's still going to be dominantly in the inner solar system, moon, Mars, possibly the asteroid belt. Yeah, that makes sense. If we were to establish a colony on Mars or another planet, what kind of governance or societal structure do you think that we should we should implement in, in some sort of a civilization like that. <laughs> well, you know, and that's why we avoid the word colony because it's, it's got such loaded baggage with, with it. Right. And so when you think of going to a new place and, and creating a settlement, um, it, and this is where I think science fiction is so lovely and so helpful. I was listening to NPR once and someone on it said, no one ever invented something that someone didn't imagine first. And that's what we do with science fiction, right? We, we think about what, what it would be like to have a settlement on the surface of Mars or the moon or, um, you know, in the outer solar system. And so how do we think about doing it where we give all people voices, where we maybe try to transcend some of the issues that seem to divide us on earth. And that's always this idea that you say, let's not, whether it's looking at how we've dealt with Antarctica, you know, how do you take that spirit of scientific cooperation and move that out into the solar system and not take the competition aspects out into the solar system? That would be my dream, kind of the ISS model. Export that not some of the other stuff. So I was at some point going to ask you what your favorite show was. So you've already given that away, which is The Expanse. Um, have, you, have you seen, um, so my favorite show, um, which I actually talk about too much, arguably, is um, For, All, For All Mankind. And I'm yes, curious well. if you've, uh, I, see, I see Rachel nodding her head because I think I've brought this up like a hundred different times. Uh, sorry, you said, you said you have seen it. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I'm curious, um, and, and, and what I actually love about the show is that it hits on so many interesting, um, um, both political and commercial uh, items that really do apply today. And I am curious, like, you know, there, there's a lot of dialogue out there about, you know, whether we're in a space race right now um, or not, or another space race, I should say. Uh, so I'm, I'm curious, what do you think it means for, um, you know, other governments like China uh, that have built up significant ability now to to um, go to space and explore? And, and obviously that 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 gap, that that technological gap that used to be present is now kind of converging very quickly. What do you think that means for um, exploration at large? Um, and ultimately, you know, I would argue that one of the biggest drivers of our ability to go to the moon as quickly as we did is because, you know, the U.S. wanted to beat the Soviets to the moon. Do you think that type of um, competitive spirit still exists today? And if not, do you think that's something that's going to grow into the current sort of um, mindset of, of U.S. 
um, exploration, space exploration. You know, we explore for inspiration. We explore for knowledge. You know, we explore, as we've talked about, for commercial benefit. And we explore for for competition, for geopolitical. Um, you know, and th- those four things, I would argue, have always been there. And I don't think they're ever going to completely go away. Um, what I think is amazing is when the Apollo astronauts came back, from the moon, the Apollo 11 crew, one of the things they commented on is when they traveled around the world after they had returned, people would come up to them on the street from countries all around the world and say to them, we did this. It was humanity who had done it. People who go out to space talk about something called the overview effect, that when you look back at Earth, you don't see national boundaries you see this blue planet with this incredibly thin, fragile atmosphere. And what I would hope is that as we move forward, are those four motivations? They're always going to be there. But I hope the more people we move off Earth, the more we understand we explore on behalf of humanity for the benefit of humanity. And I hope that that spirit which I think is embodied in the International Space Station, is the spirit that we take outward with us. That's a great answer. So uh, um, I'll ask my last question and I'll let Rachel tee up hers, but um, what is your favorite uh, piece or installation from the, from the Smithsonian and why? Oh gosh, it's like I have three children and like they're always trying to jockey for position like, you know, which one is my favorite? They're they're not. I don't have a favorite. Just putting that out there in case any of them are going to listen. Um, you know, probably one of my favorite um artifacts from the Air and Space Museum is Amelia Earhart's um uh cheeky red Lockheed Vega plane um that she flew. Partially because it always reminds me what she had to overcome at that point to be a woman aviator when women were so constrained in, in what people thought their roles were. And the other reason I really like it is because we have a lot of people who visit the Air and Space Museum who ask if that's the plane she disappeared in. Um, think about it. Um, so I think it's funny on many levels. Um, and then my <laughs> other favorite new artifact, which you didn't ask about, um, is the X-Wing fighter that we have on loan um, from Disney, which actually flew. Well, in one of the Star Wars movies, so. Okay, it didn't actually fly. It was our (laughs) green screen. (laughs) Just as good. Um, And I'll do my last question, um, which Ellen, I want to know if you could travel anywhere in the solar system, I want to know where you would go, what ship you would want to ride on, uh, real or fictional, and what you would do there. You know, for me, again, I'm a fundamentally, I'm a geologist. I'm a kid who grew up picking up rocks and cracking them open and hunting for fossils in Ohio and Michigan where I grew up. So to me, I'm afraid it really is the surface of Mars, um, uh, you know, breaking open rocks, finding that ancient fossil that shows the chances of us not being alone in this solar system, in this universe are are pretty high. And of course, I'm going to, take the uh, Rossi from uh, the expanse. So, so um, sorry, I know we said that was the last question, but I have to ask one more, which is, um, so Mars, um, now I, I, I would bet if I asked you if there is, if we, if, if we find, if we were, will we find evidence of life on Mars? I, I, my bet is that you'll say yes. Um, and tell me if I'm wrong, but my follow-up question would be, do you think that we will find evidence of life that is still alive today on Mars? That's my question. I think when you consider that the conditions on Mars, um, about four and a half billion, or about four, sorry, about 3.8 billion years ago, strongly resembled those on the Earth when life evolved here. Mars had all the similar conditions, similar building blocks. I would be surprised if life hadn't evolved. But conditions after about 800 million years on Mars turned pretty harsh. So to me, chances are life went extinct and it didn't get very exciting before it went extinct. So we're talking about like single cell, simple multi-cell evidence. So this isn't like an exciting type of fossil for most people, but for a geologist, it means everything because we can start asking questions about 
Would it have had DNA and RNA like life on Earth? What elements did it use? So huge questions that we'd be able to start asking about the very nature of life itself. Amazing. Ellen, thank you so much for being on the show. It was such a pleasure. Um, and I, I certainly learned a lot. So thank you. Um, really appreciate you being on the show and can't wait to have you back. Thank you. It was great to talk to you guys today. Thank you very much. 